Hello brothers and sisters of Christ. Uh, today we're going to be talking about words to no profit, the word human. Before we get into this, brothers and sisters of Christ, make sure you have your King James Bibles out, God's perfect written word for the English speaking people, and that you're following along. If we don't turn to all the scriptures in the study, make sure you're pausing the video and you can turn to the scriptures. Um, the reason we do that, brothers and sisters of Christ, is because this is our final authority. And what's going to go along with this study is I've been dealing with a lot of people lately that's been attacking there being a perfect written word of God today. Okay, These studies, if it has nothing to do with the gospel, which everything kind of tracks back to the gospel, especially today, this is where we find our wisdom. Okay, God is the one that teaches us, and our wisdom is through God, for, through fearing God and keeping His commandments. And God's promised to preserve His word. And that's what we have today in the, in the King James Bible for English-speaking people. But I've been trying to defend this with a lot of people that don't want God's Word. Which is going to go into the study pretty well. Alright, so make sure you have this open. We won't be turning everywhere in the scriptures, but you can always pause the video and turn. I'm talking about I'm not going to be turning physically, because I don't want this video to be a long video. If it was going to be a short video, then God showed me something, then God showed me some more, and it's like this video that I'll end up thinking it's going to be like a 30 minute video. It'll end up being like an hour, hour and a half. So let's get into this, okay? Make sure you get your King James Bible. I pray, brother and sister Christ, that you're all doing great. Right? I don't hear that much from the brethren lately in these last days. Um, either because I lost my endorsement, my endorsement, and uh, whatnot. And some of you brothers that have been following me understand what I'm talking about. But I haven't lost my the, the endorsement that matters. I haven't lost that. But, you know, the wisdom of men... Uh, the praise of men. I've lost some endorsement. But that's another thing. But I don't hear that much from the brethren, period. And I've talked to brethren, other brethren in ministry, and they don't hear that much from the brethren either. And it's like in these last days, we're getting distracted by what's going on in the world, by the flesh. And we're really fighting, brother says Christ, to keep standing. We're fighting the flesh. We're fighting uh, the world. Okay, remember what the Bible says. Our battle is not flesh and blood. Okay. Our battle is uh, against uh, principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay. We're to try to live our life for Jesus Christ. We're to stand for His Word, and we're supposed to be a light to this world. Uh, I've been getting into the, we're going to get the second part of the uh, 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 Jesus, name above all names, the hymn, the second half. And one of the things I talked about when I was doing the study recently was talking about light. We're supposed to be a light to the world. Okay. And we're supposed to. We're not supposed to be getting out there trying to force the world to live God's way. Okay, they have a choice. God's way or the world's way. That's the only two choices you have. There's not a million choices. That's the deception. Oh, I've got a million choices. I can choose that path. That All paths except for one. All paths. I'll say it again. Except for one. Lead to hell. Every single one of them. There's only two ways. God's way or the world's way. We're going to get into that a little bit in this study when it comes to the wisdom of men versus the wisdom of God. So human, one thing that brought, got brought up in the pat my past was that why don't you use the word human? Well, my first thing to say, brother says Christ, is it's not in the scripture. The word human is not in the word of God. And when something's not in the word of God, it means you've really got to look into it to find out what is really going on. Because why didn't God choose the word human? Like Godhead, why didn't God, God use the word, I mean, he chose Godhead, why didn't he choose the word Trinity as a title or a description? Okay. Uh, repentance, which will be a whole other study on why I don't use the word repentance again. Words to no profit series. We talked about in the past, but we can talk about things again. Just because you did one video on it doesn't mean, oh, I'm done. Uh, we're supposed to keep preaching truth no matter what. So make sure you're preaching truth no matter what, brother and sister Christ. But one of the reasons I didn't use human was because it's not in the scriptures. But then when I got into ministry, God's like, uh, you might probably want to do a little bit more study on why the lost world. So we're not just going to talk about, it's this simple. The Bible doesn't use it, so I don't use it. I say man or mankind, okay? Because sometimes the word man can be for me, like a man versus a woman. Remember, a, a woman is a man with a womb, and he was she was taken from man, wool man. Okay, so there's man can be a reference to a man versus a woman, separation. Sometimes in the Bible, man can be a reference to mankind. Everyone. Okay? It's just saying man is in mankind. 
That's what the Bible teaches, and that's the word that the Bible uses. So why does the lost world like to use the word human? But before we do, let's break down the word human. Okay? First thing I do, and I always tell people this, great uh, tool tips for Bible studies. I got them over here. I'm looking over here. You got a concordance. I've got an online concordance that makes it easier, and you can do a lot more searching with the online program. But if I lost power, and I did before doing a study, I've lost power before. Um, so if I lost power doing a study, I still have the physical copy of the concordance, so I can look up words where they're at in the Bible. I ignore the Hebrew and the Greek, and that's my suggestion to you. I don't speak Hebrew, I don't speak Greek, and there's no one today that spoke the same Hebrew and the same Greek. There's no one alive today that still spoke it like the Bible. Even if you, even if you look in the Jewish people, God's going to come back and correct it, I believe. I really do. Uh, the, the, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Some people start getting on to me. Some people believe we're going to be speaking Hebrew. Right? But in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, there's still going to be other nations other than the Jewish nation. So I still think the languages are still going to be around during the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. In heaven, what's the heavenly language? It's going to be, some people say it's going to be Jewish, Hebrew. The point I'm making is, is today, the Hebrew that was spoken back then is not the same as the Hebrew today. All right. now, I don't want to get too much into it, but you have the Texas Receptus that backs the, the concordance that backs this book. Over 99% of all Greek and Hebrew extant manuscripts line up with this book right here, over 99%. But we have a concordance. We have a Webster's 1828 Dictionary is what I got. And I have the physical copy. I always try to suggest, brethren, that if you're wanting to invest in Bibles, get some Bibles. That's the first thing. But if you want to invest, the next series of books I would invest in is not, because I have Peter Ruckman's books. I've got some of other brethren's books. The next books I would truly invest in is getting a concordance and a Webster's 18. Uh, it's like an original, it's a recopy of the of Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Okay, If you try to get an original, <laughs> they're expensive as can be. But if you get a reprint, that's the word I'm looking for. If you get a reprint, they're not that expensive. Right? And I got one. I also have the Webster's 1828 Dictionary online. Sometimes I try to compare the two. Now remember, because we're going to learn in this study, I like using the Webster's 1820 Dictionary for definitions, and I write them down. I showed you guys in a study, and some brethren that were lazy didn't like the study because I didn't finish it. I left it to you to finish it. And some of the brethren are lazy in the sense that they don't like this being the final authority. You had some enemies that attacked because they don't want this to be the final authority. But some of the brethren are starting to forget that this is supposed to be our final authority, and they're starting to stray. So even though I wrote down all the word we did, I forgot what the word was, but we did a word study, and I told you to write down every definition that the Webster's 1828 Dictionary did. Then I said leave a couple numbers, like for more definitions, that this might not have, that this has. Right. Give me a second. I'm, I'm house-sitting. I'm house-sitting. Not house-sitting. I got finished house-sitting. I am... Watching dog. I'm a dog sitter right now, and she got into something that's going to make noise. No. So I'm house-sitting a neighbor's dog, so please forgive me. But I always said leave back to the study. Sorry for the interruption. The study, uh, that this Bible will have definitions that's not in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. It's not there. Okay. So if it's not there, we go off of this. Sometimes this definition, which we're going to find out today, is going to be a pain. Go sit. Go sit. <laughs> it's going to be a little bit of a pain. Sorry about that. But for this study, we're going to learn that sometimes they'll give you a definition for the world, but if you actually research it more, it's not the definition they're giving you. It's a lie. It's deception. We're also going to learn that there's nothing new under the sun. Okay? When the Bible talks about all is vanity and there's nothing new under the sun, it's talking about apart from God. Apart from God, all is vanity. All is vanity without Jesus Christ. Without God Almighty. Okay? And there's nothing new under the sun. So, we're going to start this with, since the word human is not in the Bible, Let's see what the world says that, that human means and how it's used. 
And then we're going to talk, and we're going to show you the true definition of human that they're trying to hide from people. And then we're going to see what the Bible has to say about their de what the true definition of human is. And I'm going to, and when we get through this, brothers and Christ, you're going to understand why I don't use it. I use it for um, teaching purposes. I use it to say this is what the world thinks. Okay, this is how the world uses it. But when it comes to the scriptures, I'm not a human. And when I was lost, I had no problem with the word human. But now that I'm saved and God's wisdom is what's showing me things, uh, I'm not a human. And brothers says Christ, neither are you. Okay? But one of the def three definitions that we find in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary is, one, belonging to man or mankind. Seems innocent, right? Belonging to man or mankind. Pertaining or relating to the race of man as a human voice, human shape, human nature, human knowledge, human life. Now all that sounds great, right? Until I show you what the true definition of hue is. Man's in the Bible, but then they added the word hue to man. And we're going to go through that definition again, going through the world's, what the world said. I copied and pasted some of the world's definitions when you look up the word hue. Definition number two says, having the qualities of a man. And you know what that reminds me of? The pagan trinity believers that just can't let go of their pagan trinity uh, terms, can't let go of their pagan trinity. And I told you, it was an old video uh, a few years back, that I said when they... Have, they teach this. It's, this is how Satan works. It's the Godhead, because that's what the Bible says. So he'll say Godhead. Let's say someone who's not a Bible believer. They're a servant of Satan. They're trying to weasel their way in. They're a wolf in sheep's clothing. They'll start out saying what the Bible says. Remember, Satan can quote Scripture. But over time, Satan starts adding to Scripture. It's Godhead. Then over time, he, Satan adds to Scripture also known as the Trinity. And then, after a while, it dropped and went to where it's the Trinity, also known as the Godhead. You know what else Satan does? He subtracts from Scripture. Then they took Godhead away and just said, it's just Trinity. But it didn't stop there. I showed in a video where there was preachers out there preaching and teaching that Godhead and Trinity are not the same thing. They've separated it completely and said that the Godhead just meant Jesus had the qualities of God. That's all Godhead means, just quality. They totally destroy what the King James Bible teaches the Godhead is. And this has come from people that, those, that minister that was teaching that was come from someone who claims to be a Bible believer. This book is my foundation in all matters of faith and practice. And yet, and yet, when you ask them chapter and verse on capital T, Trinity is a title for God, they don't care. I'm going to use Trinity. Human, having the qualities of man. Well, the Bible doesn't use the word human, but I don't care. I'm going to use it anyway. That's the attitude of so -called, these so-called religious teachers and leaders, supposedly, in Christianity. I say that with my fingers because I, I admit the word Christian has been abused and misused and I prefer Bible believer because this is where you're going to test somebody where they truly, truly are one of God's people. This right here. What's their attitude towards the book and are they living it? Period. Do they add to this book? Do they subtract from this book? Do they ignore this book? People say, oh, you're worshiping a book. The Bible says, I will worship towards thy, it's in the Psalms, I will worship to thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Samuel, when you read the book of Samuel about Saul, Saul got in trouble. Why? Well, he, he did what he thought would please the Lord when he had kept the animals that he was supposed to slaughter. And he kept the animals for a sacrifice. And what did Samuel say to him? Does God have pleasure in offerings more than he has in obeying the commandment of God? Obeying his word. That's where God wants. That's why the Bible says, and we're going to talk about it in more detail, that the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments, his word. This is the true test. This right here. What's their attitude towards this? Right. What's their attitude towards absolute truth? Are they taking God's truth and hiding it in their heart and living it? 
Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee? Or if all shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How they walk, how they live their life. This is the true test. And they don't like that. They try to take the true test away. Hugh man. Okay? And I'm getting ahead of myself, but we're going to get into the hue, and you'll, it all makes sense of what I'm saying right now. Hugh man. But here it says just having the qualities of man. So it sounds innocent, right? That sounds innocent. Profane. Not sacred or divine as human author. Okay? It says it's not in use that way. Well, sounds in innocent. But you look up the word hue, and hue is synonymous with homo sapien. Human, homo sapien. What does homo sapien mean? Wise man. So one of the things when you're looking into researching the word hue, it talks about you being a wise man. Not just a man. That's why they had to add the word hue. You're not just a man, a created being with a lot of problems. And we are. You're a wise man. Now, they're saying in a, a lot of the textbooks for the schools there for a while, they started saying homo sapien sapien. Homo be, being the man and then sapien being wise. Wise man. Wise man. Now they're saying you're wise, wise man. So we're not just wise men, we're wise, wise man. You have to say it twice. Like you're emphasizing just how wise mankind is. And we're going to see what God thinks about mankind's wisdom. Some of you know those verses, praise the Lord. Some of you stick with the book, praise the Lord. Okay. But other studies find that Hugh also means God. It's a God. Hugh is a false God. And when you add Hugh to man, you're saying man is godlike. Uh-oh. That in itself should go, as a brother or sister in Christ, that should get you to go... I ain't having anything to do with the word human. Absolutely. Uh, it's not a sin to say the word human, but when you use it in relation to yourself, it becomes a sin. Because what does human mean? It's a God. And when you, like I said, when you link it up with the word man for mankind, you're saying mankind is God or godlike. Hmm. Hugh is an ancient name for a God. It has been used for thousands of years as a prayer. You also find it goes back to Egypt, which goes back to Mississippi Babylon. So you have Catholicism that goes back to the Roman paganism that was there, the Roman mythology and everything, and it goes back to, that dates back to uh, Egypt and their false gods, which goes back to Samaramis, uh, Nimrod, and Tammuz, which goes all the way back to Mystery Babylon in the Bible, you know, where God confounded their language. And then later on down the road, it's just more information, but you had um, Nebuchadnezzar come along and find the same place. That It's not an actual tower, because they say it's a tower. No, it's a square upon a square upon a square upon a square, and it's so high up that it makes it look like it's a mountain. Where God talked to Moses again, he reveals himself to Moses on a mountaintop. They always think that if you're at that top of that mountain, you could be a god. And that's how they were in the Old Testament, and that's how they were in the past. Okay? To this day, we're still trying to build structures that reach to the heavens. There's nothing new under the sun. But it says here, it has been used for thousands of years as a prayer, a mantra. So it's not only a name for a false god, it's a... It's a hue is, is a word that's used like a, a prayer, a mantra, a chant, sacred chant to attune oneself to the presence of said god. And many spiritual traditions, sound plays an important part. Kind of like in these Babel buildings. The type of music that they're playing. Okay? To elevate the flesh. To get your flesh riled up. So you can have a flesh experience. A very emotional... They, they, they um, mistaken the flesh for really being emotional. Okay? But it's a flesh experience. Okay? In many spiritual traditions, sound plays an important part in uplifting the individual. Self-gratification, self, you know, pleasing the flesh, elevating the flesh. Uplifting, it's up, about uplifting the individual, not like us, brothers, says Christ. We're all about lifting Jesus Christ up. 
and His Word. He is the one we worship. He is the one we praise. It's not about us lifting ourselves up. But mankind is always about tearing God down and His Word and lifting themselves up as gods. I'm getting a little ahead of myself there because we're going to get to that one. That's lifting the individual. He was a key to open your heart to said God's loving presence in your life. Oh yeah. You look up the word you. Like I said, do a research. Don't take my word for it. Do some research on the word. On the, say, type in H-U and say, say God as a God. That's what I did. I typed in H-U as a God. And I started getting all this information. You find out where he was from. Now I understand why they added to the word man. Okay. So when you add he to man, you are saying that man can become gods or god-like. They're god-like. They're their own gods. You can be as gods? Hmm. Where have we heard this before, brothers and sisters in Christ? Anytime you hear something in the world, it's because they're taking it from God and perverting it. There's nothing new under the sun. Almost everything out there is the Bible perverted. Is God's word taken and perverted? So wherever you heard this, that ye can be as gods, it's an old lie. You've heard that saying, Brother Jesus Christ, it's the lies as old that something is as old as time itself. This is a lie. This is a lie. We're getting all kinds of interruptions today, but we're gonna keep going, Brother Jesus Christ. Uh, it's a lie. It's as old as time itself. Ye can be as gods. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe creation, get turn to Genesis. We're going to be going to Genesis 3. That when God created light and created the world, that's when, when time started. Okay, But some people believe time didn't start until after the fall of Adam and Eve. So, that's just some people. The right? point is, is God created time, and time did start at one point. And we can agree on that, hopefully, brothers and sisters Christ. But turn to Genesis chapter 3. Where have we heard this before? Hugh, man, ye can be as gods. And remember what it said, Hugh, homo sapien, wise man, ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil, knowing knowledge. You can be the wise one. You can be your own god. Where have we heard this before? This lie. As old as time. Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more subtle than the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Remember we talked about this, brother and sister Christ. It's so important. There's more to this passage than a lot of people realize. They just blow this off like it's nothing. Yea, hath God said. What's the first step that Satan does? He brings God's word into question. Yea, hath God said. That's his first step. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden, and the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye, not, she now, ye shall not surely die. So I started by questioning God's word. And I, I, I've been dealing with a lot of people that are doing this lately. Especially ones who profess. I deal more with people who profess to be Bible believers. And they still have the attitude that Satan had. Yea, hath God said. Chapter and verse on this. Well, I can't prove it, but it's basically there. I mean, it's not technically that the word Trinity is not there. But, yea, hath God said. They question God. He should have used that title. He should have used that description. He should have used the word repent. He should have used the word human. Human's not really in the Bible, but you know, yea hath God said. Then Satan, and once you get them to question God's word, then Satan flat out denied God's word. I didn't put his command in here, but God gave Adam a command saying, Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in the day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. Spiritually and physically, they were supposed to die physically. We talked about this in another study. God saved them through animal sacrifice. Their sin was covered by blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, what the Bible teaches in the book of Hebrews. Okay. But spiritually was the number one thing that they died. They died spiritually. Their fellowship with the Lord changed. A wall came down. It was never the same from that day forward. 
What does sin do? It separates us from God. But first he brought it into question, and then he said, no, he's lying. God's lying. God's word is lying. You know, shall not surely die. For God knoweth that the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Ye shall be as gods. And that's what gets man to this very day. Yea, hath God said, and ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. You can be your own god. You can be your own wisdom. You can decide what's right and wrong. You can decide what path you want to take. You can be your own God. You listen to yourself. You're the final authority. Not the Lord God Almighty who created the heavens and the earth. That created all things. Oh no, he's not the final authority. You can be the final authority. And that's what we're fighting, Brother Sis Christ, to this very day. We're fighting the world that are acting like humans. But because they won't submit to the Lord God Almighty like we have. Our creator. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is God. And, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also to her husband and her, with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, them, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God Almighty, Lord God, amongst the trees of the garden. What did that sin do? It got them to hide from God. They put a wall between them. They still had fear, but now they're afraid of the consequences. Right? There's godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. They're, they're, they have, they're afraid of the consequences. There's fear in God because he said don't do this. That fear was still there a little bit. That's why they hid themselves. But it put a wall between them. And that's what sin does. That's what the wisdom of men does. It puts a wall between you, the, uh, mankind, and their creator. Okay. So points to remember for this. Human, we said, what does it sound like being wise? Wise man, godlike. You're godlike and you're wise. You have your own wisdom that can rival God's because, well, frankly, you can be a God and you can be like God. Where we heard this before, we just read it. Mankind, Satan's been using that lie to this very day. And you know what's most popular word here in America used? The word human. Mankind's been done away with. You, you don't hear hardly anybody say anything on mankind. I mean, listen to the news, commercials, television. I'm not telling you to go watch that stuff, but if you remember that stuff in your lost life, looking back, they use the word human a lot. They hardly ever use the word man, mankind, as in mankind. Unless they were. Because sometimes they'll quote from the Bible, misquote it, or abuse it, and, uh, and whatnot. But they like to use the word human for today. In the, in the um, public schools, they use the word human. That's what they're cramming down kids' throats today. So when you see something on here, Brother Says Christ, that seems, oh, it seems so innocent. Because look, it just say belonging to man or mankind pertain, pertaining to or, relate, or relating to the race of man. Now when it says the race of man, man there is talking about mankind. See, they're using man as mankind in the definition. But remember, it's all about pulling us away from the Word of God. Remember what it said over here, as a human voice. Human. Now that we know what this says, it's God-like wise. You can be, have a God-like voice. You can have a wise voice. You can, have a, you can have a say apart from God's Word. You can be your own God. Okay? Human shape. Your God-like shape. And your shape is wise. Human nature. Once again, you have an, a godly nature. Godlike. Human knowledge. Once again, your knowledge can rival God's. You can know better than He does. And human life. You have a godly life. Now today we talk about living a godly life in, as far as your walk with the Lord, but with the lost world, their life is godly. They can choose any path they want apart from God's commands. 
God's wisdom, and they're living a godly life. Isn't that a big deception today? Do we see that today in a lot of people out there in this world? Oh yeah, they're acting like they're their own God. Now, you know, I've turned here, but we talked about this before. Revelations 4.11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and, and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. What we were created to do, please God. What is this whole ter uh, satanic term, human? What's it about? We just read that. About pleasing yourself. When you actually look up the definitions, upli uplifting the individual, uplifting the individual. And so putting man down and lifting up God Almighty, Jesus Christ who is God Almighty, the true Godhead, God the Father and the person singular of Jesus Christ, instead of lifting him up and putting, us, putting yourself down, all this is about is you lifting yourself up and doing away with God, putting him down to the point of doing away with him. A, you can't do away with God. They're all going to have to answer for him. The Bible says, Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Everyone will. But they think they're being deceived. They think they can do away with God. They think they can become their own gods. Ecclesiastes 12.11 I mean, 12, chapter 12, verse 13. Chapter 12, verse 13. When I've taught this, some, some brethren got mad at me. Why? Because they don't want God in authority over them. It's the only explanation. Okay. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Okay. I knew a woman that she came out of a system that had to do with uh, keeping the laws in order to be saved, a false religion. And one thing I don't get is that she claimed... It's very confusing. First, she got saved when she was 12 years old. And she still claims that. But then she talks about how she came out of this system of you had to do works in order to be saved. You know, you had to keep the laws, the ordinances, okay, in order to be saved. And now she's just gone to the extreme, the opposite way. Yes, you don't have to do works to be saved. You've got to come to God. We've talked about this. You come to God on His terms. And when he looks at your heart and you've come to him on his terms, he will save you. And when he saves you, you now belong to him. And what they do is they'll take it to an extreme, the other direction, saying, I'm not under God's com under any commandment. I'm not under any laws. I'm not under any commandment. And we did a study on this and it upset some of the easy believers. And I said, are we under the law or laws? Plural. They think that once they get saved, they're not under any law. But in Romans chapter 8 says that I've been saved. I'm under the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord and Savior. I'm under the law of God. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. If you love me, keep my commandments. When I got saved, I didn't get freed from having to obey God's commands, because that's what the Levitical laws were. There were God's commands showing us that not just the laws that were written on our heart, it got put in writing. So there can be no question. God says, this is right, that's wrong. And they think when they get this easy belief, if I get saved, I don't have to be under anybody's law. I don't have to be under anybody's command. I am under my own laws, and I'm under my own commandments. I do what I want. I do what feels right. If it feels good, do it. You've ever heard that excuse? Doesn't that line up more with you, man? You can be as God's, knowing good and evil. You get to be your own command. You can do whatever you want. No, when I got saved, I'm still under the commandments of God. He commands, I obey. Same thing with you, brothers and sisters in Christ. This whole thing, going back from the beginning... He can be as God, knowing good and evil. Right. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. What did we read there in Genesis 3? We've talked about this, I know, recently, but we're doing it again for this study. What did Satan do? He questioned God, questioned his word, his command, and then in order to get Eve to turn her back on God's command, what did he have to do? 
He had to try to take the fear of God out of her. Take the fear of God away. Oh, he said you, were di you, were, you would die? That's the fear of God. And the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's the fear of God. So what does he do? He takes the fear out. Oh, ye shall not surely die. Ye shall not. It goes hand in hand, brother, says Christ. If you fear God by, by comparison, the evidence of fearing God is you're doing your best to keep his commandments. That's the evidence that you fear God. There's some brethren out there, I'm not going to go into it too much, that have stabbed me in the back. And it's not that I'm trying to get personal, but I've seen it with other brethren that's gotten stabbed in the back. Okay, what happens when you have brethren turning on each other? They've forgotten to fear God, and if you look at how they're acting, how they're treating people, does it line up with the book? No, it doesn't. Why? Because it goes hand in hand. If they're not keeping his commandments, that's because they don't fear God. If they're not doing things God's way, it's because they don't fear God. They're starting to become a human. Ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. You get to decide how to treat people and what's right and what's wrong. They're not lining up with this book. You see it with the lost world and how they treat each other. That's to be expected. But among us, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a final authority. My wisdom, I'm, I have no wisdom apart from this book. My wisdom, apart from this book right here, that has the true plan of salvation, was leading me to hell. I was on my way to hell and I deserved to go to hell. I deserve to go there. I still deserve to go there. And it's only by God's grace that I'm not going there. And it's not because I can just do whatever I want and live however I want. No. It's because what Jesus Christ did for me, and now I belong to Him. He commands, I obey. Okay? True wisdom. Psalms 38, 8. True wisdom. Okay. Where do we find true wisdom today? Psalms 38, 8. Kind of already given that away, but it's not my words. It's, let's use God's word. I know some people don't like using God's word because this is the final authority. This will convict you. That's why the Bible says this is a double-edged sword, and it, pier it knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. It pierces the heart. That's why people don't like it. Psalms 38, 8. No, I'm sorry. Psalms 33, 8. Forgive me. Psalms 33, 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. So there we see the fear. What we're supposed to do? We're supposed to fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Psalms 111, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Why? Why is the fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom? The next part of this verse. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. Why is fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom? Because you fear the consequences of going against Almighty God who created all things. Just, almighty, powerful, righteous God. If you fear Him, when He says, don't do that, abstain from all appearance of evil, you're going to abstain from all appearance of evil or do your best. And when you fail Him, you're going to have that fear and that conviction to repent. Okay? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord. Why? Because it goes hand in hand with keeping His commandments. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Okay? True wisdom, without this would be a whole other study if we wanted to go into it hardcore, true wisdom comes from God. He commands, I obey. God knows what's right. I have the laws of God that are written on my heart, but there's a big conflict before I was saved. There was a struggle between the soul and the flesh. When they say your heart, it's talking about the soul, I believe. Sometimes it can be a reference to the spirit. Right? But you're spiritually dead before you're saved, and... Your soul is connected to your body, and the body is the one that's ultimately in charge. The body is the one that's going to ultimately get his way eventually when you're lost. You have your soul and you have your body that are connected. So the, body, the soul can try to restrain the body for so long, but eventually the body is going to get its way. How many of us can testify to that as a lot when we were lost? 
In the end, our, our flesh is the one that was in charge. Well, now our soul is connected to Jesus Christ, that spiritual circumcision made without hands. Our soul is connected to Jesus Christ. He is in charge. So your body, a body is always going to be in charge. Is it going to be your flesh that's wicked and sinful, or is it going to be Jesus Christ? Which one's going to be in charge? And a lot of people, when you do, like I said, this is the test right here. Is Jesus the one in charge through his word? He commands you to obey. Or is your flesh in charge? How are you treating people? Now, I hit this up with some brethren. It's like, the Bible says that... Um, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You're not supposed to reward evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. The Bible talks about for today. How are you reacting to the lost world? How are you reacting to your brothers and sisters in Christ? God honest them, brethren, because they weren't acting correct according to this book. And you know what they have? Their attitude is, is I don't care what the book says. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. They're starting to act Foolish. What does the Bible say? A fool has said in his heart there is no God. That's a fool. No, God, singular. So you have the one true God, but the fool says, you know what? I can be my own God. The fool believes that there's multiple gods, plural, or they can be their own God apart from the one true God. The fool has said in his heart there is no God, singular. Capital G, God, singular. Fool comes along and says, I can be my own God. Mankind, human, mankind can become gods. We're all basically walking and talking gods. Yeah. Okay. So where does true wisdom come from? It comes from our from God Almighty. His laws, through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when Adam and Eve ate there, his laws got written on every man's heart. It's his laws that are written on our hearts. And the laws are what? A schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. To let us know that what he did on the cross, that's the only way that we can be saved. We can't save ourselves. Those laws are to let us know that we're dirty, wicked, filthy, low-down, no-good sinners. We've broken so many of God's commands. We've sinned against God. People got mad at me at that because I tried to explain what sin was according to the Scripture. Sin is basically going against God's commands. When God says, don't do it, you did it, you've sinned against God. God said, you're to do this, you don't do it, you've sinned against God. What is sin? Going against God's commandment. Once again, I bring him back to a final authority. But they like to have the authority of saying what sin is. Eh, I don't believe it's sin. Well, I don't care what you believe if it goes up, if it's contrary to the Word of God. It's that simple. What happens? Replacing God with man. Psalms 5.5. 5. Yeah, okay. make sure you turn, but we're going to be going through a lot of verses real quick. Psalms 5.5 5 says, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Hmm. So fool here is related to people who work iniquity. Remember what the fool said. The fool said in his heart, there is no God. Fear God, keep His commandments. What happens when you don't fear God? You don't keep His commandments. That's called working iniquity. That's sin. When you're going against God's command. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't fornicate. Uh, you know, so on and on and on. Drunkenness. Do not to be drunk. Be not drunken. Okay, these are commands of God. You break them, you're now working iniquity. And what happens? You're not fearing God. You're turning yourself in your own God. You're a fool. You're acting foolish, though. This says foolish. Now, I've said in the Bible, the word fool, by itself, fool is talking about someone who's lost. But foolish is acting like someone who's acting lost. Remember in Galatians, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? He wasn't saying they were all lost. He was saying they were acting like they were lost. Because this wasn't their final authority. What Paul, when he was preaching the word, because it can be the spoken word or the written word. Today we have the written word. This is what we uh, is our foundation. This is what we hold everybody accountable to. Back then, Paul was preaching. It was the spoken word that was getting written down at the time. But it was still God's word. 
They weren't going off God's word. They were going off wisdom of this world. They let people come in and start talking back into getting under the law in order to be saved, going against the true plan of salvation. Oh, foolish Galatians. They were acting foolish. Now, Psalms 14, 1 is where we get the fool that said in his heart, there is no God. Now stop. What happens when you have a fool that says there is no God? They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. Their works, their actions. There's none that doeth good. What happens when you have someone who says there is no God? They don't fear the one true God, and they don't keep his commandments. They do their own thing. They're their own gods. You can be as God's knowing good and evil. Psalms 53, 1, we read, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Corrupt are they, and have done abominable iniquities. I'm sorry, I, I kind of mixed the two together. Psalms, let's start with Psalms 14, 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable work. There's none that doeth good. Psalms 53, 1 says, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Corrupt are they, and have done abominable iniquity. Sin. What is sin? Going against God's commands. Going against God. The do's and the don'ts. That's what sin is. They've done abominable iniquity. There's none that doeth good. It's relating that to the fear of God. It's relating that to a fool. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Because if there is no God, then there's no one that I have to fear. Now, you ever heard that saying, there's nothing to fear but fear itself? Hugh, man, the wisdom of, that's the wisdom of men. It goes against the Bible. We are to have fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Because if you fear God, you're going to do your best to do what He commands you to do. The first command for today is what, brothers and sisters Christ? Obey the gospel, which we have done. And we're currently doing. I'm not saying we're earning salvation. I'm talking about when you get saved, you're trying your best to be a light to this world. And the Bible talks about the falling away where some people, their light's not shining so bright. God's salvation through us is supposed to shine to the wicked world. How he saved us, we're supposed to be a living witness, a living testimony, a light into the world. God's supposed to shine through us. Right? So obeying the gospel, we're supposed to be living a changed life, a new creature in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to be, if any man be in Christ, we're supposed to be in Christ. But here you see it, it's linked. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And what goes with that? They go against God. If Satan can say, Yea, hath God said, and do away with God, his word, do away with the fear of God, he can corrupt man hardcore. And look at the world today, brother says Christ. Is it corrupted? In America, it's it's I keep thinking we're in the last days. I believe that. We're in the last we've been every generation, it's getting worse and worse with every generation, and every generation looks back. Uh like me, I look back at my childhood and I look at the children of today and say, it is so wicked. 50 times more wicked than I was a child. We're in that last day where that tree is about to hit the ground. And when that tree hits the ground, God's going to say, come up hither. When you cut down a tree, it starts off very, very slow. You see it swaying. And by the time it goes to fall down, that last little bit is quick. And I see that today. It used to be, this is uh, my grandfather's day. He said when he was a kid... Compared to my, uh, his son's day, I'll say his son's day, it was like two times worse, three times worse. From my childhood to my daughter's day, childhood, it felt like it was 50 to 100 times worse. Okay, they're pushing feminism hardcore, sodomy hardcore. Okay, uh, they're, it's just the ungodly, hardcore. And it's out in the open. It was kind of in my day. It was kind of hidden. They were trying to sneak it out. They were trying to push feminism by kind of keeping it uh, on the down low, as they say. Um, but today it's just right out in the open, right in your face. Sodomy used to be on the down low. I joined the military. Don't ask, don't tell. It was before, a little bit before my time, before I joined the military. Don't ask, don't tell. Now it's in your face. They want you to tell. They want it to be in people's face. And there's nothing you can do about it. Sodomy is out of control. Why? Because the fool has said in his heart there is no God. They're acting like godless people. No fear of God. They're acting like 
Hugh, I'm pointing at the Webster's 1828 dictionary. Hugh man. They're acting like Hugh mans. Godless people. They're their own gods. Right? They're their own gods. You know what our attitudes save people? We, we just looked at that. Okay, the fool. These are the lost world. The fool and said in his heart there is no God, and his works line up with it. Don't let anybody tell you real quick. Don't let anybody tell you you're not allowed to judge. Whether when someone comes along and says, I'm a Christian. Remember, Christians is a Bible title for those that are of the church of the living God. The reason we don't like using the word Christians is because it's been perverted so much. But someone comes around and says that I'm a Christian. I'm one of you. I'm part of the church of the living God. I'm part of the church of God. I'm a saint. I'm a brother in Christ or I'm a sister in Christ. I'm trying to go through everything washed in the blood. Okay, I'm in Christ just like you. I'm in Christ just like you. Don't let them tell you you can't judge them according to this book. Because you can the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You come, I've had a lot of people claim around me, my neighbors in town, they'll say amen to my uh, uh, gospel stickers and magnets on my truck and everything. And I'll go hand them gospel tracts. Oh, I, I'm already saved. I'm already a Christian. I'm a brother in Christ or I'm a sister in Christ. Then why, my thing that gets them upset, I'll look at them and go, then why are you living ungodly? Why are you living like you're godless? Let's say it that way. Why are you living like you're godless? Why are you living like you're godless? I look at you and I don't see someone who loves. If the man loves me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him. We'll come unto him and make our abode with him. I don't see someone that loves Jesus Christ. I see someone that loves the world. Not all the time. I see some brethren. I meet brethren. Praise the Lord. But, we're, that's, but I'm still supposed to hold everybody accountable to this book. This is our standard. Even G, uh, Paul said, prove your own selves. He talks about there being people reprobate in the faith. They're fake. They're false. They're worthless. They're not saved. Prove your own selves. This is how. What's their attitude towards God's book? Okay. That's the lost world's attitude. I can do what I want. I'm a hue man. I can do whatever I want. I'm my own final authority. I can say what I want to. I've had one person tell me that the Bible is just a guideline. In other words, they're saying they can just take what they want and throw the rest out. What are they doing? They're acting like they're God. Saying what's okay and what's not okay. This I'll throw out. This sounds good. I'll keep it. I'm already keeping this one, so I'll keep it. Oh, I'm going against that one, so let's take that one and just throw it out so I can continue in my sin. Why? What's going on? You have the false religions out there, or wolves in sheep's clothing coming in, and they're infiltrating this and trying to pervert this. Look at all the Bible perversions that are out there that downplay sin. And you have the Bible perversions that uh, tear Jesus down, tear God down. They're always trying to pervert this. And they come in there and they say, well, uh, you can, it's your feelings and opinions. If it feels good, do it. And then it's been with us for so long, brothers and sisters of Christ, with culture and heritage and church fathers and everything. They say, we've always have done it. You hear them say, we've always have done it this way. What's the big deal? We've always done it this way. I don't care if you've done it that way for 2,000 years. When you find out that the Bible doesn't line up with what you're doing, what are you supposed to do? Continue in that, what you're doing? Or conform your life to this book and make sure it lines up with this book. You need to make sure your life lines up with this book. And people don't want to do that today. And I, like I said, I get in so much trouble with professing Christians out there. Because their attitude doesn't line up with this book. Um, men, I've, I've, I've hit men up with things in this book, but one of the biggest things is uh, I go to town. There's times where I want to walk on the beach. I pull up to the beach and I try to go to side beaches. But if I pull up to the beach and I see a lot of the modestly dressed women and everything, I turn around and I go find another beach that seems more vacant where I can sit there and walk with God, the cute cards and talk to the Lord. Okay. Why? Because the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. And in this day and age, it's almost impossible. Once I leave this door, go outside this door, I say, it's almost impossible. But the point is, is I'll get on a beach. This seems to look okay. I'll start walking. I'll come across on a woman that professes to be a sister in Christ. Now, this is going to upset some of the sisters in Christ out there, but truth always does. 
Oh, I'm saved, I'm saved. Oh, you are? That's great, that's amazing. And we should get to talking, and one of the things I always hit him up with is, okay, can I ask you something? The Bible says that, Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Okay? True love for Jesus Christ is keeping his words. If a man love me, keep my commandments. You're my friend. You say you're the friend of Jesus, but is he your friend? You say he's your friend. The Bible says you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. This is Jesus Christ speaking. So I simply sat there and I asked her, I was like, what are the three commands that God gives on the appearance of a woman? And you know what I get back most of the time? Who are you to judge me? I'm not saved by works. I never said you were saved by works. I'm treating you like a sister in Christ. And I've done questions to brothers at the same, in the, almost on the same thing. Okay, what are the two commands God gives on the appearance of a man? What does God say about tattoos? And piercings. Right? But I hit him up and I, said, I just asked him a simple question. I'm treating you like a saved person and I'm asking you, because I wouldn't ask a saved person, what does the Bible say about this? I would tell, I mean a lost person, I wouldn't ask a lost person, what is the Bible, what's the three commands God gives on the appearance of a woman? I wouldn't ask a lost person that. I would tell the lost person that the Bible says this is sin, the Bible says that is sin, you are a sinner, you're on your way to hell, and you need to get saved. Repent and believe time is running out. That's what I do with a lost person. I'm treating them like they're saved. They say they're saved. I'm treating them like they're saved. I simply ask them, what are the three commands God gives on the appearance of a woman? The Old Testament talks about a man's not to wear the apparel of a woman. Women are not supposed to be wear the apparel of men. Today it's been all meshed up that women look like men. Men look like women. The Bible talks about how a woman's had to have long hair for it is a blessing given to her by God. And when you cut your hair short, you're rejecting the blessing of God. A woman, you know, a woman, I understand, before you get into this, sisters in Christ, I understand that if it's, I'm talking about when it's in your power and under your control, God gives it to you, you can get sick, you can lose, for whatever reasons, you can lose hair, okay? But I'm talking about when it's in your power, you can have long hair, but you choose to cut your hair very short. That's what we're talking about. You have a choice. Is this your choice? Or the world's way your choice? That's what we're judging here. Okay, we're judging righteous judgment. I was said, judge not on the outward appearance, but judge righteous judgment. What's your attitude to what the book says? Long hair. So you're not supposed to, and then the Bible talks about how a woman is to wear modest apparel all the time. Okay? So the three commands is you're not to wear the apparel of men, you're to wear modest apparel, and you're to have long hair. That's the three commands God gives on the appearance of a woman. And my judgment is not whether they, she could have short hair, she could be wearing pants. That's not my judgment. My judgment's not on the outward appearance. What's our, what's our judgment supposed to be? What's their attitude towards this book? And almost every time, these professing Christians, their attitude is, is, I don't care what the book says. I like my short hair. I like wearing pants, especially tight pants. I like being immodestly dressed. I like wearing the apparel of men. I like my short hair. And my, I think it started with my grandma's generation. They started, the elderly started cutting their hair short. And I'm in a retirement community. And almost every elderly woman that I come across, for the most part, I'd have to say 80% of them have really short hair. Yeah. What's your attitude towards this book? Is God, capital G God, the authority? Or are you your own authority? The men around here, since it's the beach, I like I said I'm in a retirement community, but I'm also near the beach. So around here, I come, I run into men that are really old, acting like little children, that are surfers, man. We're surfers, man, and they have super long hair. What are the two commands that God gives uh, uh, for the appearance of a man? Now I've said this before: a man's not commanded to dress modestly all the time because if he's out in the field with other men, he can take his shirt off. He can gird up his loins. We talked about this in another study. You gird up your loins to go to war for the armor of God. You gird up your loins with truth. This tells you how to live your life. And it tells you how to fight a fight. Spiritual battle. Spiritual warfare. Those are two reasons why you gird up your loins with truth. But it's also it's liking that image to a man that girds up his loins to either go work in the field or to go to battle. Okay, They're not supposed to be women in battle. 
There's not supposed to be women in the field working. Okay, that's what men do. They provide for their home. Today, everything's been blurred and everything's all feminism. I can do it. And I'm not trying to go off too much from what we're saying, but this is the lost world's attitude. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Why? Because you're living godless. You're not living as if God's in charge and he's the one in command. You're living like you are in charge and you're the one that's in command. But the two commandments, a man's not supposed to wear the apparel of, of a woman. It's that simple. And a man is to have short hair because a man that has long hair, it is a shame unto him. And the Bible talks about how the lost world likes to glory in their shame. And someone says, well, it doesn't say it's a, sh a sin. You look up the word shame, and anytime someone has a right to be ashamed in the sight of God, you should be ashamed, it's because you've sinned against God. You've gone your way, you didn't go God's way. You didn't do things God's way, you did things the world's way, you did things your way. You should be ashamed of yourself. Why? Because you've sinned against God. Oh, no, no, but it doesn't say it. They don't want to compare Scripture with Scripture. But the two commands God gives on the appearance of a man is he's supposed to not wear the apparel of women, and he's to have short hair. So these, some of these guys have hair that go all down, almost down to their buttocks. Oh, yeah. And they all put it up beneath this cap, and they go out there, and they, you know, the suit that has the hood and everything, the, the wetsuits, and they go out there, and they go surfing, man, surfing. But I'm a Christian, man. Okay, I'm going to treat you like you're, you profess to be saved. I'm going to treat you like you're saved. Now I can start saying, hey, what does God say about this, and what does God say about that? Holding them accountable to this book. We hold the lost world accountable to this book as far as letting them know that they're sinners, and the only way to get saved is through Jesus Christ. That's what we hold the lost world accountable to this book. But with the brethren, we're supposed to hold them accountable to all of it as far as now, okay, the changed life. What you're doing there is wrong. You need, to, you need to repent. You need to change and line up with this book. That's what we're supposed to hold. The Bible says you confess your faults one to another. It says, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, exhort. That's lifting the brethren up, saying, you're doing right, keep it going. You're on the narrow path, stay on that narrow path. We exhort one another. It's like, you know, encouraging them. They exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Where do we get our doctrine from? This book right here. Where do we get our instruction of righteousness from? This book right here. This is the final authority. So when I'm looking at them, I'm asking them, what is their attitude? What I'm really asking them is, is what, without saying it like this, I'm not asking them, what's your attitude towards God's perfect written word. I'm asking them, what is their attitude towards God's word through asking them, what does God's word say about this? What does God's word say about that? Every, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of changed a little bit, but every Trinitarian that's come to me, I've asked them, what's your attitude? I'm asking them, what's your attitude towards this being the final authority when I ask them, cap, uh, Chapter and verse on capital T, Trinity is a title for God. Well, it's not really in there, but, but it's there, but it's not there, but it's there. Their attitude is, is you can be as God's knowing good and evil. You can correct this book. You can add to this book. You can subtract from this book. You can flat out ignore this book when you feel like it, because ye are as God's. Isn't that what the lost world does? Human. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. Then why are you acting that way? A lot of them got angry and left and just took off and never heard from them again. But I had some brethren come back later. I had one guy that really went off on me verbally. I, I use this testimony because, brothers says Christ, even if it feels like the world as a whole doesn't want the truth, we are still to preach the truth to them. We're still to keep preaching the truth to them. I had a guy come to me online and he just was trying to convince me that Trinity was truth and that if you don't believe in the Trinity then you're, you're, you're lost and everything and the biggest thing I kept pushing him no matter what he said or what he did I just kept pushing back to the Word of God and said chapter and verse on capital T Trinity is a title for God and anytime he says well that doesn't really matter then I'd go back it'd be like I'd stick to these two things anytime I say where's it at in the scripture and he says I don't care that it's not in the scriptures is basically what he's saying then I'd go back to, is the Bible your final authority? Yes, the Bible's my final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Then I'd go back to chapter and verse on capital T Trinity as a title for God. Lowercase t Trinity as a, as a description for God. Well, it's basically there, but... Uh, uh, then I'd go back to, are you a Bible believer? It's that simple, Brother Jesus Christ. That's what you're supposed to do on everything. 
when you're dealing with somebody that seems like they're in whatever area of their life, they might try to obey this book 90% of the time. And I mean 90% of their life. But there's always that 10% that we all struggle with and we all fight. How do you deal with that? Chapter and verse. And if they don't want to ignore the Word of God, then you bring them back to, are you a truly a Bible believer? Well, yes, I am. Okay, then if you're a Bible believer, it's got to be in here. This is your foundation, right? All matters of faith and practice. It's got to be in here. And I've, I've gone back and forth with some people where that one guy, he got so upset that he blew up at me, called me names, heretic, heathen, servant of Satan, be gone, I'm done with you, Pfft, gone. I didn't hear from that guy for four months. He came back later for months, and I wasn't mean to him. I didn't call him names. I didn't look at him and go, you are lost if you believe the Trinity. You're a lost heathen. Go to hell. No, I tried to, in meekness, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. I preached truth to him. I planted a seed. Someone else will come along and water. And evidently, someone came along and water. Four months later, he came back to me and says, I'm sorry for how I treated you, brother. You're right. Traditions of men aren't the final authority. Heritage, culture, that's not the final authority. Worldly heritage is what I'm talking about. Because I always tell people this is our godly heritage right here. When you get saved and born again, this is your heritage. Nothing trumps this. Nothing in this world. Right? But he said, you know, church fathers, uh, traditions of men, it's all garbage. And I was wrong. I just... I wanted to, he had the attitude like most of you are taught, brother says Christ, I want to fight for the Lord, I want to fight for the Lord. But are you truly fighting for the word of the God, the Lord through his word? Are you fighting for traditions of men, worldliness, been deceived? He apologized and we got to talking and he's like, you know what, I'm just going to use Godhead from now on. Capital T Trinity is not in the Bible. Uh, lowercase Trinity is not a title, a description of God in the Bible. And nowhere does it say God in three persons. And they're trying to pervert with personalities. Human, you can be wise, you can be your own God. So they're perverting def words in the Bible. They're coming up with their own definitions of words that don't line up with it, with the Bible. A person has to have a body, soul, and it's always referred to someone who's living. Someone who's dead, past tense, is not referred to a person. You can refer to someone who's dead as long as you're referring to them at a point when they were alive. Do you remember so-and-so? Do you remember that person... Talking about past tense, that used to always, you know, ask you for a dollar. That, that you remember that person that always kept begging a dollar from you? Yeah, they passed away a year ago. But when you're referring to them as a person, you're referring to them when they were alive. So you have that. But a person has to have a body, soul, and spirit. That's what the Bible says. It's the Bible definition of person. And he's just very nice. He came back and he's. And the whole point of this testimony, brothers of Christ, is we got to keep preaching truth and make sure you're doing it in meekness. You can get frustrated, you can get upset, and I get frustrated with brethren, I get frustrated with the lost world, I get frustrated, number one person I get frustrated was this guy right here. I, you know, My past, I'll sit there and talk to the Lord about my past, my present, and sometimes I talk about the future, the, ch uh, the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, what life's going to be like up there? How am I doing, O oh Lord? And when I start failing the Lord, the number one person I'm frustrated with is this person. Second is the body of Christ. Last is the world. I do get frustrated with the world, but not as much. The Bible says when they try to act like humans on their way to hell, what do you expect? The world gets as wicked as it does because they don't fear God, and they don't care about God's word, his commandments. They don't care about this. They're going to live however they want to live. Okay. When you look at people, we judge according to this book. Are you trying to act like a human? Are you acting like a child of God? Now are we the sons of God? Okay. Are you acting like a brother and sister in Christ, a saint, part of the church of God? Are you acting like a person that's in Christ? Your life, your actions, do they line up with this book? Now what is a, a person's attitude towards God's commandments? Fearing God, keeping His commandments, the God be in the wisdom. Psalms seventy three twenty two. We hear this: So foolish was I and ignorant, I was at my, I was as a beast before Thee. 
Someone comes before God and says, So foolish was I, and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Lord, I failed you. I started acting like the lost world. I let my flesh get the better of me. I just, Lord, I'm just so worthless. Please forgive me, O oh Lord. We look that there's a difference, okay? There's a difference, supposed to be a huge difference between someone who's saved and someone who's lost. There's a fool and there's someone who's a saved sinner. And when a saved sinner starts going back and acting foolish, looking, talking, acting like the lost world, laughing at the lost world's jokes, turning their back on this book the way the lost world does, trying to act like you're your own God, correcting this book, adding to this book, subtracting from this book, you're starting to act foolish. And this is in the Psalms. It's up to 73, so I can't remember if this is King David or Solomon. But King David did some foolish things in his life. He had a man murdered. He committed adultery and then had a man murdered to cover it up. That was very foolish. That's what the lost world does. Why? King David, why are you acting like a lost person? He was acting foolish. He let his flesh get the better of him. We come to God and go, Lord, I was acting so foolish. The fool comes, doesn't come before God. The fool looks at himself in the mirror and says, what you're doing is okay because I said it's okay. Don't you worry. I, your flesh is like, don't you worry. I got you back. Yeah. Yeah. Proverbs 9, 6. Proverbs 9, 6. Forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. Where does our understanding come from? The Lord God Almighty. Where does the world's understanding come from? Mankind. The wisdom of men. Our understanding is based off the wisdom of God. Forsake the foolish. Remember, the fool had said in their heart there is no God. So if you forsake the foolish, you're saying there is a God, and he's in charge. Command, and I'm going to do my best to obey, Lord. Command me, and I'm going to do my best to obey. I always say my best because there's no one here on earth except for Jesus Christ, who is God manifest, God the Father manifest in the flesh. Only God the Father, when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, was able to be sinlessly perfect, keep all the commands. Right? But nobody else in here can keep God's commands. We can only do our best and have a heartfelt attitude that our desire is to keep God's commands and do our best to live for Him. That's why I always say it like that, Brother Christ. We're doing our best. Are you doing your best? Or can you do better? Have you forgotten and you're like, oh, I, 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 as long as I do my best, but you realize you're really not doing your best. You can do better. Right? Forsake the foolish. I'm not going to be that lost person anymore. Paul always warned about resurrecting the old man. What was the old man? The old man was acting like a Hugh man. The new man is in Christ. He commands, he obeys. That new man obeys, does their best to obey. 1 Corinthians 14 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. When you first get saved, brothers just Christ, as a child of God, when you first get saved, you're going to have the understanding of, of a child and be like, what, what, what's wrong with this, Lord? I don't really see what's wrong with this. You start reading the book. You start hiding God's word in your heart. You start maturing as a Christian. You start growing up as a Christian. Paul talked about this being a babe in Christ, that they can only handle milk, they couldn't handle meat, because they're babes in Christ, they're children in the, in the faith. But at some point, you need to grow up and you need to mature and to be an adult in the faith. And as God starts showing you things, when you were a child, you looked at that and said, I don't know, Lord, I, I just don't see a problem with it. When you mature, God starts showing you things, He starts teaching you, He starts raising you up. You look at it as a mature person and go, I know exactly what's wrong with that, Lord. I can't believe I had that in my house. It's gone. I can't believe I was doing that, Lord. Forgive me. Oh, I wasn't doing this when I was supposed to. As a child, what's the big deal? As an adult, you understand what the big deal is. I'm going to start doing this, Lord. 
As a child, I, got, I read my Bible every once in a while. As an adult, I read it every morning, every night. Now, I'll get around to a Bible study every once in a while, and you realize how important it is to study the Word of God and hide it in your heart as an adult. When I was first told, you know, you first look at saved, here's a King James Bible. You need to start reading it, you need to start studying it. You're like, yeah. You don't realize until you start growing and maturing how important this is. You're not supposed to be little children all the time. You're supposed to grow up in the faith. You're going to be a child of God, but you're supposed to grow up in the faith. Ephesians 5.17. And where do we get our wisdom from? That's the whole point. From the Word of God. From God. Our wisdom is through God. By the Holy, through the Holy Spirit. By God. The Father. Ephesians 5.17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding that the will, what the will of the Lord is. When you grow up as a child, when you first get saved, you don't know 100% what the will of God is. You have some of the basics, the milk, the gospel, and you're saved, you belong to God. But after a while, God starts teaching you what His will is for the whole part of your life, all of it. And you start doing your best to live it. Colossians 1.9, For this cause we, all, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's our prayer. That's my prayer for you, brother, says Christ. I hope that's your prayer for me, that we all take this book, God's Word, and we're hiding it in our hearts and we're doing our best to live it. What's the will, number one will of God? That none should perish, that all should come to repentance. We need to be preaching the gospel. Minister of reconciliation. Okay? How do we please God? Fear God and keep his commandments. Okay? For this is the whole duty of man. Okay? What's the will of God? This book tells us. Philippians, oh, put on the whole armor of God. That's one of the will, wills of God. The ministry of reconciliation. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. These are all different, where God tells us, this is what my will is for you. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And the peace of God, the peace of God. Remember, the Bible says we were without God and we were without hope in the world. And we're supposed to be ready to give an answer to a man in Peter, in 1st, 2nd Peter, we're supposed to be ready to give a man an uh, answer to a man for the hope that is in us and the peace of God. Why are you so peaceful? Why aren't you, what's going on in the world? Everything's falling apart. Why aren't you falling apart? Because God saved me and I'm his. God can save you and you can be his. You want the peace that I have? Let me tell you about my Savior, Jesus Christ. Shall keep your hearts... And minds through Christ Jesus. What are we supposed to hide in our heart? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee? No. They said that. Dog sitting. Okay. Brother says Christ, I don't use the word human because it's about men being the wisdom. It's about the will of man being the final authority. It's about ye can be as gods. And that's all that humans all about. That's why I don't use it in relation to me, to you, brothers and sisters of Christ. But there are times, though, I'd like, like we did in this study, where I'll tell you, why are you acting like a human? Why aren't you acting like a child of God? Because you look up the word human, you're acting like you're your own God. Apart from this book, God's not the final authority. You're acting like you're the final authority. Now, get me wrong. They're not humans. They're not their own gods. They don't have any real true wisdom apart from God the Father the one true God, but they like to think they do. Why are you acting like that? What does God think about the wisdom of this world? The world call themselves human. 1 Corinthians 1.18. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1.18. And this is what it comes down to. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. You know what man's wisdom is all about ultimately, what it's going to do? 
It's going to turn people from the true plan of salvation. It's going to turn people from the real, true God and the real Jesus Christ of Scripture, the King James Bible. It's going to turn them from that and prevent them from going to heaven. All the wisest men. I mean, look at all the theologians and the wisest men that, that's been on this planet. Where they all end up? Hell. And then they're going to be tossed into the lake of fire. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath, God, hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. See, the world call it, thinks it's foolishness. What, you believed? You're a King James Bible believer? Okay, you're a Bible-believing, God-fearing man, an actual Christian man according to the Scriptures? You're, so, you're, you're a fool. You're a fool. See, they call us a fool. So God says that made foolish... Um, for, that af for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness, that the world calls foolishness, a preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks a Foolishness. That's how we know that's why God's in the context here. God's not saying it's foolish to preach the gospel. He's saying that the lost world looks at it. The Greeks look at it as foolishness. You're just a fool. They look at me like I'm just a fool. But I'm not. And neither are you, brother Jesus Christ. They're the fools. They're the ones that are being their own gods. Denying the one true God. But unto... But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Who's my wisdom? Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Then he turned around and said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's why Jesus is referred to as a capital W word, and the written word is, and spoken word is referred to as the lowercase w, when the God's word's being spoken through the Holy Spirit, through men, or it's been written down by men who are moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay? And then you have Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, that when he spoke, it's God speaking. That's why it's a capital W word. But it says here, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. You think it's foolishness to get saved and go to heaven? Who in their right mind would think that's foolishness? Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weaknesses of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, what I just say, look at our history, the world's history, all the wisest men in this world, going back to the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, the wisest men, they never get in. When they say, I'm not wise, I'm nothing, my way's wrong, the world's way's wrong, I can't get to heaven my way, I'm, I'm worthless, I'm fool, I'm a fool, Lord, I'm, I, I'm, I'm on my way to hell. Until they come to that point where they drop, they're going about to establish their own righteousness, their own wisdom, and do things God's way, not man's way, okay, now, not many wise men after the flesh, they've all gone to hell. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. See, they call us foolish. He's chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. You know one of the problems with so-called Christianity today is trying to conform to the world, trying to show the world that we're strong. I'm nothing without Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to be showing the world. I'm nothing without Jesus Christ. I have no strength of my own. He is my strength. 
we're to stand for this, we're not to compromise, we're not to turn to the left hand or the right hand, we're supposed to stay on the straight and narrow course. But today it's, it's popular to go turn to the left hand or the right, to, tr to add to this book, to subtract from this book. Okay? That's what it's talking about there. I'm weak. We're supposed to be weak, brothers and Christ, in the flesh. And to, and to this world, we're supposed to look weak. Why? Because we're not supposed to shine. I don't want me to shine. And this whole push today, this false Babel building, some false so-called Christianity today, is that you are strong and you can shine. Well, if you're strong and you're shining, guess what's not strong and guess what's not shining? Jesus Christ in your life. If you want Jesus Christ to be strong and Him to shine in your life, you've got to be weak. So he can be strong. You got to look like a, you got to look foolish by standing for God and the changed life, living for Him every day, being a physical like physical example, testimony, along with your words. You got to be foolish to the lost world so God can be wise. Verse thirty. But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Redemption. 31. That according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And that's what it comes down to. Are you glorying in the Lord, or are you glorying in this? I did this, and I did that, and I save people. I had someone tell you that. I save people. You don't. I do this, and I... You see what's going on here? They're glorifying themselves. And they're glorifying in their flesh. They're glorifying in themselves. They're not giving God the glory. I will never use human in relation to the Bible because it's not in the Bible. I'll never use human for myself and for you brothers and sisters in Christ other than to say, I'll use the word fool versus foolish. Are you acting foolish? Are you starting to act like the lost world? I'll use the word fool versus foolish. But the word human, that's not us. I'm going to end it with 1 Corinthians 3, turn to 1 Corinthians 3.18. No flesh should glory in his presence. When you try to act like a, like a fool, you're trying to glory in, in God's presence. You are your own God. 1 Corinthians 3.18. 1 Corinthians 3.18. I'm dog sitting and she's getting a little anxious. I've got to take her out here. 1 Corinthians 3.18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. I know nothing, Lord. I'm, 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 uh, I know nothing, Lord. Show me. You have to come to this book saying, this is God's perfect written word. This is absolute truth. God knows what he's doing. God has the right way. His way is 100% right. My way is 100% wrong. You've got to come to him like that if you want to be wise, for him to impart his wisdom to you. The Bible says, He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And there's a, pot, uh, a verse that talks about how to him that believeth, when it talks about his written word. When, God, when you come to the, God's word, you have to believe that it's God's word. It's perfect, it's truth, it's it's 100% right. You have to believe in it for it to effectually work. It effectually worketh also in you the belief. Yeah. That he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Now how about the Bible talks about he sends them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who hold the truth and uh, in unrighteousness, or have pleasure in unrighteousness, but hold the truth in unrighteousness. They don't have Jesus Christ's righteousness imputed to them. They have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. He, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. I don't know how many people I come across that I look at them and they're on their way to hell. They're on their way to hell to burn for all eternity, and I'm pleading them with, them, with tears. I'm pleading with them on how to go to heaven, and they don't want it. They believe they're already on their way to heaven. They found the back door. And they believe that they're already on their way to heaven. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. 
And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Remember, all things are vanity without Jesus Christ. Man's way is vanity. It's God's way that matters. God, a man's wisdom is vanity. It's God's wisdom that matters. That they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men. And you see that a lot, brother, says Christ. Like I said, the true test, the true test that I hold people to, I hold them to this book, whether it comes to eternal security, uh, the true plan of salvation, uh, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, which includes looking present tense for that blessed hope. We don't know when Jesus is going to catch us home, away and take us home. Therefore, we're supposed to be looking for it every day. It's, some people call it the imminent return of Jesus Christ, but the Bible says it's looking present tense for that blessed hope. We're looking for Jesus Christ to call us home. Are you ready? It goes hand in hand with it. Mm -hmm. When I talk to him, instruction and righteousness. Do they glory in men, or is this their final authority? The Godhead. Do they believe the Godhead of the King James Bible? Is this their final authority, or is it the words of men that are final authority? There's a lot of people who believe in the Godhead of the King James Bible, brother says Christ, but they use the Trinity terms. But if they have, a, it seems like men today have a hard time letting go of traditions of men, church fathers, culture, heritage, worldly heritage, worldly culture. They have a hard time letting go of this world for the Word of God completely, letting go of this world. I believe some of them are saved, don't get me wrong, but they have a hard time letting go of this world to serve God fully and completely, this being the final authority. They have the hardest time. Therefore, let no man glory in men. For all things are, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come are all yours. And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. And why do I keep reading that verse? Verse 22. Or start at verse 21. Why? Because God's going to let you have things in this world, brother, says Christ. There's some of us that you're going to have things. You're going to have things in abundance sometimes. So there are going to be some people that are lacking, brother, that are lacking. You have some brethren that are in abundance. But the things that God gives you in this world and how you're living your life in this world, we need to remember that, yeah, God's given us this stuff. He's letting me live here in this house. He gave me the wood stove, the chickens, the garden. Uh, be able to go to the beach and walk and talk with flashcards. God has let me do things, but I've got to remember the number one thing above all of that is what? Verse 23, some brethren are forgetting. Oh yeah, these are all mine. God's blessed me with this. It's a blessing from God, and it is. I'm not mocking that. But here's the part that becomes bad. It's such a, a the world starts coming first. And that this is all mine, and, and, and I get puffed up, and then I start becoming the final authority, and I start doing what I want when I want. What do they do? They forget verse 23. Okay? It says the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours in this world that God has given you. But you can't forget this very important part. Don't ever forget this, brother, says Christ. And ye are Christ's. These things that I have belong to me, but i got to remember, ultimately, I belong to Jesus Christ. This stuff doesn't really matter. I can't take it with me when I die. It's a blessing. Praise the Lord. He lets me do these things. But i got to keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. And ye are in Christ. And what is Christ? Christ is, and Christ is God's. Plural, shown ownership. Christ is God's body. Okay? When you get to the Godhead. But Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. First, you got to remember you belong to Jesus, and then you got to remember that Jesus is God, the Father, manifest in the flesh. He's God. Are you forgetting that, brothers and Christ? What, what gets in the way of us remembering that? The wisdom of this world. Man's wisdom, the flesh, what's going on in the world. So, I'm sorry, Brother Jesus Christ, I didn't mean to take this too long around, but why don't I use the word human? Uh, words to no profit. Words come in to no profit, as you haven't followed along so far, is words that go against this. People taking words from here and perverting it. People taking, uh, taking words out of here and putting in their own words. 
ultimately it's to get you away from this. Yea, hath God said, and to get and to take away the fear of God. There should be fear. I'm serious. When I hit up someone who says, you know, I can dress however I want. I can live however I want. I can act however I want. Someone comes to me and says, oh, I believe in the Trinity. Where's the fear of God? My first thing that I want to ask him is, where's your fear at? Where's the fear of God? Because you're, you're questioning his commandments and you're rejecting them. Where's the fear of God? You're not to add to this book. You're not to subtract from this book. If the Bible says that men are supposed to have short hair because it's a shame if men have long hair, then you better cut your hair short, men, brothers of Christ out there. I'm not going to hit the lost world up. They're on their way to hell. I need to tell them about Jesus Christ. Yes, I need to point out their sins, but I need to tell... Uh, you think if that's really going to let them know that they're really sinners because they have long hair? Eh, not much. You know what really lets them know that they're a sinner? It's when you start hitting things that even their heart, that prick their heart, you have to hit them with really hard things. But when it comes to someone who's saved and born again, my first thing is that I ask them is, Where, do you fear God? Where's the fear of God? I had my mentor, I'm going to just throw this out there, I had my mentor turn on me, he started bearing false witness, he started name calling, he started uh, backbiting and whispering, gossip, When you do that, brother, sister, and he wasn't the only one. There's other brethren that are pushing out on everybody. Just everybody talking about everybody, name calling and, and mocking and, and being sarcastic and everything. Where's the fear of God? Is that how we're supposed to treat our brothers and sisters in Christ? Where's the fear of God? Oh, I don't care. I like Trinity. Where's the fear of God? Oh, I like easy believism. Where's the fear of God? person who truly fears God, this is their final authority. And ultimately, they might, like I said, that one man, I give him his testimony, that one man got mad at me and stormed off, but he came back later when he calmed down and prayed about it and said, Lord, he had a heart for the Lord saying, I want the truth. He still had a love for the Lord and he made a mistake. He, he, he sinned. He sinned against a brother. He sinned against God. He repented. He got his heart right with God. He's got his heart right with his brother. And he got back to his walk with the Lord. Praise God. You can make mistakes. I've made mistakes, but this is Christ. But my first thing that I need to start coming back to when I'm dealing with some people is I need to, instead of getting into, especially online with people that I don't believe are saved, I need to come back to they're professing to be saved. Is this the final authority? And if this isn't the final authority, where's the fear of God? Where's the fear of God? You're acting like you're the lowercase, you're the you're a lowercase g God, because there's only one capital G God, but you're acting like you're God. You're, just, you're making the commands. You're, you're the one in charge, not, not Lord God Almighty. You are acting like you're in charge, and it's your way. Your attitude is it's your way or the highway. No, the truth is, is it's your way which is going to lead you to hell. It's God's way that go to, that, that's taken us to heaven, and we're going to have rewards waiting for us for how we live a life as a Christian, as a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, a saved sinner. Okay. So you can either lose rewards by doing things your way and the world's way for someone who's saved, or you can do things the world's way and your way for someone who's lost and on their way to hell. So, brothers and sisters Christ, words have meaning. Please, brothers and sisters Christ, make sure that this is your final authority. I'm going to go ahead and write and wrap this up because I'm getting motivated. Uh, sorry about the whining. Sorry about the dog. So I, play, I pray that you guys were able to stay up and keep on I'm going to have this dog for a, for a week, so i got to get some studies out regardless. Okay. Um, brethren, this is our final authority. If you see a word that seems innocent, but if the Bible doesn't use that word, make sure you study the word a little bit more thoroughly. Hugh, it has to do with a God. It has to do with man being God-like, and man being its own wisdom, and the why you follow the wisdom of man. I'm not a human. I don't ever want to be a human. I am a saved sinner. I used to be a fool, and sometimes as a saved sinner I act foolish, and God's got to knock me down sometimes to pick me back up. Remember what the Bible says about Jesus being the rock. Those who uh, fall on this rock shall be broken, but who this rock shall fall on it shall ground him to powder. 
Okay? God will break us in our life as a Christian when we're not living right. We start acting foolish. It's called chastening of the Lord. Okay? But I'm not a human. Neither are you, brother, says Christ. And the, and the lost world can pretend like they're humans all they want. Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? They're all going to have to stand before Jesus Christ and say, You are right. I'm wrong. There's going to come a day. You're right. I'm wrong. Jesus is the Lord God Almighty. Every knee shall bow. Brother says Christ, stick to the book. Stick to the book. So grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. I'm praying for you, Brother Jesus Christ. Please, please keep me in your prayers. And it's getting very cold out here. The wood stove's working. Uh, I'm praying for the brethren for what's going on in the world. I have sister, brother, sister Christ all around the world, and I'm praying for everyone. Right, keep us in your prayers. Keep praying for the brethren. Right. I will see you in the next video.